Um, all right, well, let's just get right into this. You know, before Jesus ascended, he empowered and he commissioned the apostles. In verse 8 from the passage we just read, Jesus tells them that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And then he said, you will go out and be my witnesses. And when we are born again, we receive the Holy Spirit. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit and are called to be witnesses to Jesus Christ in the world. Sound familiar? Sound the same? Well, it is, right? It, it really is the same. The apostles were not the only ones called to be witnesses, but all those who come after them. I've got this uh, allergy thing going on. So. We also read in Acts 1-3 that Jesus prepared them for 40 more days before he ascended. And you think about that, he had already prepared them for three plus years. He had taught them and, and, and minister, you know, ministered to them. And, but he says that they, he appeared to them for 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And I think what he was doing before he left was making sure he, they were on track, that he really gave them that last deeper understanding and encouragement. And Jesus may have not physically appeared to us, but by his Holy Spirit, we are called. Right? We are called, we're sanctified, we're empowered, and we're commissioned. Our, still, our teaching still comes from Jesus directly, but through the words of the Bible, right? Through what was written down by the apostles and the disciples. And we follow the same Jesus. We follow the same Jesus. We are equipped by the same teaching and by the same Holy Spirit. And we live in the same messed up world. So we have the same commission to take the gospel to all the world, to baptize, to make disciples, and to teach. It's the commission that Jesus gave the apostles, and it's our commission as well. So I'll come back to that in a moment, but I want to look at the question the apostles asked the risen Jesus in Acts 1.6. They said, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And it, you know, isn't it that, that Jewish mindset, right? That this is why the Messiah has come. He's come um, to fill this kingship role, to destroy the enemies of Israel, to, to rule, to essentially for them at that moment to take out Rome. And interesting, Jesus' answer was not yes or no, as he so often does. Um, he doesn't necessarily give us a, a straight answer to the question that was asked, but he says, it is not for you, know, for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's in verse 7. Basically, Jesus is saying to them, hey, guys, you and I know that it's prophesied that I'll return. And I, I even spoken to you about this. That at some point I'll return to judge the world, uh, to conquer the nations. However, it's not in the will of the Father that I reveal that time to you. And then there's a, a but, right? That he says, but this is what I want you to focus on. This is what I need you to focus on. Don't get caught up or be obsessed by the, the timing of my return. Instead, be focused on spreading the gospel to the world I am sending you out to. Because it is the will. We read in 2 Peter, uh, Peter 3, I believe, that says, it is the will of the Father that as many as possible come to him that are saved, right? They say, oh, ever since the beginning of time, you know, nothing's changed. And Peter says, well, actually, he is slow, not in the way that you think, but he is patient, desiring that all would come to know him. And so we have these words spoken to us through the four Gospels in different ways, but with the same objective. And I'd kind of like to go through them just quickly, briefly. Matthew 28, see these are the commissions really, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. 
And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go there, therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. And then in Mark 16, verses 15 to 16. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And then in Luke 24. Luke 24, 45 to 49. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, this Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And then in John, and this is, you remember when uh, Jesus is talking to Peter, in the end of John, and John is following along, and, and Peter says, what about him, Lord? But it's interesting, because Jesus makes a very, just a short statement in verse 22. He says, if it's my will that I remain until I come, what is that to you? And then he says to Peter, you follow me. And, and that's really the word he's giving to us through these verses. He's saying, receive the Holy Spirit. Be my witnesses and follow me. And it's interesting, though, as you read these accounts, if you read further and before in the context, you'll find out that one way or another, um, one or more of the apostles in these accounts had doubts about that Jesus was truly risen. Even at the end, of Matthew, when you see him on the mountain, it says some of them still doubted. And... And I think with the world and the pressures of the world and the things comes in, sometimes we can have those doubts. Sometimes those doubts come creeping in about, about the risen Jesus or even about his return. But when, when that happens, we look to his word. We, we examine our hearts. We remember how he saved us from our sins. And I, I believe in that as we do that, Jesus dispels our doubts. So again, uh, we're not that different from the, the apostles and from the disciples who struggle prone to the same feelings of inadequacy uh, or inability to follow him, to be a faithful witness to him, right? Sometimes we struggle thinking that we're good enough or that we're equipped enough or that we have enough skill or whatever that is. But doubt is the work of our enemy. He wants us to not believe in Jesus, not believe in the, re the risen Jesus, to give up being a witness. That would be the greatest joy for our enemy, to stop being a witness to Christ. Instead, Jesus says, follow me, go out to all the nations, proclaiming my name, baptizing, teaching them to obey my commands. And he, he says those words to the apostles, but those words aren't for us. Those words are meant for us as well. But he says those words of the apostles, and then he's taken up to the, into the clouds to be with the Father. And so that makes me think, well, what is Jesus doing now? He is alive. He is with the Father. Well, Colossians 3.1.4 tells us that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we read that elsewhere. Romans 8.34 tells us that he is interceding with the Father for us, that he is our intercessor. First Peter, and even where we read in Matthew, uh, at the end of Matthew, 1 Peter 3.22 tells us that he is ruling because he has authority over heaven and earth, that this has been given to him over powers and principalities. And... So the ascension truly is part of God's great plan for us, for the world. It is the time in so many ways when the church, those called to follow Jesus are truly called to live out their faith, to go to the ends of the earth. 
to proclaim the good news, to preach that forgiveness of sins, that Jesus died on the cross and that he has risen. And it's what Peter says when he addresses the crowd in Acts 2. And, and you know that at the time of Pentecost, when Peter and all of the others are speaking in, in tongues and everyone's hearing them in a different language, and they're, what was it, 3,000 came to faith that day. Peter spoke using these basic story, this basic story of Jesus Christ, right? That he came from the Father, that he was able to pay the price for our sins, that we put him on the cross, um, but he rose to life again. And Peter was not alone in speaking to the crowds. This is the wonderful thing. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says throughout this, wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you and then go out. And we are not alone. We are not alone as we witness to the world. And Jesus said that he must go. I remember John 16 says this, that he must go in order that he would leave the comforter behind. That it is good for you that I would go. Otherwise, I could not leave behind for you the Holy Spirit. And he says that he will lead you into all understanding. So Jesus' ascension was planned. It was necessary. It has great benefit for us because he has left us the Holy Spirit to guide us. And Jesus has been given all authority over heaven and earth by the Father. And I, well, I'm not sure what that looks like other than that I take that for what it says, that Jesus has all authority over heaven and earth. And he's reigning right now in this moment as Lord and King. It's not that he only reigns when he returns. He reigns now. And it's not just a spiritual kingdom. I know he says that, but it's interesting because the promised Holy Spirit is in us and we are physically in the world. The kingdom is in the world because the servants, us, we are the servants of the king. The kingdom is made real through us, through the church. It is displayed, it is witnessed. And so in so many ways, we are already in the kingdom, but we are acting on behalf of our king in a foreign place, right? He says, this is not our home anymore. And, and so there, there's that, that uh, why the scriptures say we're ambassadors of Christ, representing our king, speaking on behalf of our Lord. And this is the great responsibility that Jesus has given us. And once again, he doesn't send us without help, right? We're not on our own, but we have the one, the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit, just the same as when he sent out the disciples or when he sent out the apostles. So Father God had a distinct plan, a reason to bring his son back to himself, to rule as king and to intercede for us on our behalf. And this interceding initially is Jesus standing between us on the Father, making peace between us by the work he did on the cross, by his death on the cross. But um, as we read, he also communicates, there's this intercession that he communicates our, our dreams, our desires, our needs, our prayers to the Father. And nowhere does it say that anyone but Jesus is our intercessor, not Mary, uh, not the saints, not some other spirit. Jesus is our intercessor with the Father. And it's so wonderful that we go directly to him. There's nothing in between us. And uh, when you think of some of the more traditional um, faith doctrines, they even put the, the, the priest and is between you and the communion table, right? You and the bread, because he is interceding between you. And we never do that because you, all of us as a priesthood of believers have direct access to the throne, direct access to the Lord Jesus. And that's what he desires. Jesus is our intercessor. So you see his, his ascension has a great purpose um, but I think the act of his ascending alone, just that act, is also the final proof, that, that last proof, if you like, that Jesus is the one prophesied to come. 
that he is the son who um, came into the earth and was sent by the father, that the ascension is the final witness of his Godhead. So when you see the apostles, they see Jesus ascend into the clouds. And Jesus told them before he went to wait until the Holy Spirit came upon them and then go out and be witness to the world. And then they're standing there watching him ascend. And uh, as they stood there, I think also amazed, not just they were ascending, but they had been in the presence of the Son of God all this time, right? They, and he had just floated up into the sky. And then two men dressed in white, two angels stood before them and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Basically, why, why are you so amazed by this? Jesus, your King, your Savior, your Lord, who performed countless miracles before you, who raised Lazarus from the dead and rose himself again to life. This same one is coming back in the same way you saw him go. Don't be surprised. And in Matthew 24, we are told that Jesus will indeed descend in the clouds back to earth one day. And uh, I don't think we have a slide for that, but I would like to read from Matthew 24. I'll be, oh, maybe we do have a slide. Well, I'm going to read from 29. 24, 29 on. I'm going to get the right chapter. All right, 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. Doesn't that sound great? You know, we don't know exactly when Jesus will return to gather us up. In fact, he said in the other part in Matthew that that's the Father has not given us that to know. The only thing we do know, it's stated in the passage in verse 29, that it will be after the tribulation of those days. Else, elsewhere, scriptures tells us there will be signs that precede his coming, that we'll have some knowledge of this, some understanding. But we need to go back to Acts 1-7 again, because he just literally said, the Father has said, this is not for you to know. Um. And then he basically tells us, don't be obsessed with the date of his return, right? Don't get obsessed about that. But do this, be my witnesses until I return. This is what's important, he says. He says, be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So this commission is our commission as well. Uh, Jesus calls us to grow his church. So that when he does return as many as possible and who've responded to the call of the Father to believe, are believed and are saved. So our, our, our priority is not to earnestly seek the time of Jesus' term, return, but to earnestly seek his return. And I think that's true of every believer that we should have this, this earnest desire that this, that this world, this this place which is often so hard so and truly evil and difficult and foul at times, that it would be brought to an end, that Jesus will bring it to the end, and then we, he will restore all things. We will be in his presence, and all things will be restored. But I think in many ways, the time is short, um, especially for those who don't know him. The time is short. The work of the saints is to be witnesses to Jesus, to, to proclaim his wondrous acts that by no other name can a person be saved. And I think there's no more powerful witness than often our testimony of how the Lord found us and saved us. 
So another great part of our witness is displayed by our faith in Jesus. What does our faith look like? How strong is our faith in him in the midst of tragedy, trouble, and trial? Do we stand firm through tests and trials and persecution? Will we persevere to the end? Because there's this, this strong message throughout the scriptures of the saints persevering in their faith despite all things. And if you think of it, some of the greatest witnesses to Christ by the apostles or are, are, are the apostles and followers and about how they persevered through terrible troubles to the end. And immediately I think of Stephen and his witness, which was so amazing. He's suffering death by stoning and he's praying for them. Lord, they forgive them. They do not know what they do. And that only because he was so empowered by the Holy Spirit could any person do that. Could any of us do that? And so um, we need not fear when, when we, if we come to that place in our life of extreme struggle or, or trial, because though I believe the Holy Spirit will be with us and helping us. But I think in that example of Stephen, we know Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, was standing there, was holding coats, apparently, the young Paul. And I think he was deeply affected by that witness of Stephen. You think all the apostles, apostles' deaths, but John's, um, were a witness to Jesus as they were uh, martyred, but they proclaimed their faith in Jesus Christ. They did not stop proclaiming that truth. And I think it's so important that we see that example of persevering in our faith, in our testimony of Jesus Christ, even to the end. And the thing is, we have all these martyrs through history that we can look to. I don't know if you've ever, have you read Justin's Book of Martyrs and, and um, other writings about the history of the Christian church and the people and, and of the struggles and how so many have been that faced such tragedy and stood powerfully and would not forsake the name of Jesus Christ. No less is expected of you and me. We have to understand something. Nothing's changed. Doesn't matter if it was 1,800 years ago or 1,500 years ago or 100 years ago, whatever it was, nothing has changed. Christ still desires the same for us. The same Holy Spirit works in us and empowers us to stand firm. So will we be witnesses to Jesus? Will we persevere regardless of trials and tribulation until he comes? This is the commission. This is the calling, right? This is the witness proclaiming his name despite what it costs us in so many ways. So, be strong in your faith, my brothers and sisters. Stand firm, right? Persevere till the end so that your witness of Christ is powerful and so that many others will turn and see him, see his glory and turn to him before he returns. Let's pray. You know, the great the thing Father. is that though he ascended, we are told why are, you, why, why are you looking? Because he's going to come back again, guys. He's going to come back. And so until then, um, we hold firm in our faith, longing for the day he returns, but remembering that we have this great purpose, that he's given us this calling, this, this witness to him, that others would come to know him. And uh, that's how his kingdom works. He desires for us to partner with him in that in his ministry, and that partnering is a privilege and an honor. And so we take that seriously. And so as you, you go from here today, uh, keep that in mind, that you have this great privilege of joining with Christ Jesus and witnessing, witnessing to others about him.